It's time for Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Join us as we study the uncompromised Word of God and how it can be applied to our everyday lives. We're going to talk today about being narrow-minded. Not a very popular word. Kind of going to go against the stream here this morning, but if you are new to RCC, we're glad you've joined us. We are not a politically correct church. We are a word correct church. That is our goal. And uh, everything else just has to fall where it may. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is speaking in verse 13. I'm reading out of the NIV. He said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. It's not what happens naturally. It's not the way you think naturally. This earth was given over to a fallen God, a cursed God, and therefore by default, by nature, we think like him. He said there are few that find the right way, the narrow way, the narrow gate. Our society has fallen into deception the same deceit that mankind fell for in the garden. And that is that there is another way. There is a middle road. There is a gray area. And all that deceit has a partial truth in it. There is another way. That scripture just told us that. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to that was weak, church. Destruction. There is another way. I'm not going to lie to you. God's way is not the only way. You don't have to be so narrow-minded. I've actually been told that before. Not by my husband. I'm talking about people that talk about standards. You don't have to be so narrow-minded. Why do you have to be so narrow-minded look you have choices you're not without choices don't feel like you know we like to have choices we feel trapped if we feel like we don't have choices you got choices destruction or life blessing or cursing we have choices go with me to Genesis 3 and let's look quickly at the original deception you can learn a lot when you go back to the genesis of something. When you go back to when it first happened, the devil's not trying anything new. The same thing he told Adam and Eve is the same thing he's telling you. The deceit has never changed. The words might have changed, but the lie has never changed. Genesis 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Subtle being the key word here. He's not going to come at you with guns blazing in a red suit and a pitchfork. That's not how he works. He knows you would not fall for that. Subtle. And he said to the woman, As God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Do you really? Can you not really? Did God really? Should you really? Could you not? question. You better know what God said because the enemy will bring a question. And in that question, there is a choice. You have choices. And he will present you with a choice. And the woman said unto the serpent, yeah, he said, we may eat of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat it, neither touch it, lest you die, which she misquoted. And the serpent said unto the woman, whatever, you're not really, really going to die. And you know what? He was telling her the truth, a partial truth. When you eat of that fruit, you're not going to fall over dead. But I can't remember which version it is that when God's talking to him, he says, in dying you shall die. When you make the choice of death, you begin to die. And so the enemy's facing her here with a partial truth. Usually the way he works. 
For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods. Oh, wait a minute. They were already as God. They were made in the image of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was already established. They were made in the image of God, but the enemies, he's, he's wanting to show them something different here. Oh, he knows that you shall be as gods. Well, what's your choices here? God, the triune being, or a cursed God? He's not giving them the full facts. He never gives you the full facts. He puts the carrot out in front of you. He never shows you the trap. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. They already knew good. All they knew was good. We can't even imagine that. I try to imagine, Brett, what it was like in the garden where there, there were no thorns, even just the looks of it. The earth without the curse. The mind without doubt. The mind without fear. Who would you be without fear? But here, he says, now you can know good and evil. That seems like a really stupid choice, but I'm telling you, this is the same choice that he's put in front of every single one of us today. When we narrow it down, there's only two choices. And when the enemy of God starts interpreting what God says, you better be careful. Because you better believe it'll be tainted. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, you notice here how he's using the senses? How it tastes, how it looked, and how it's going to make you feel? She took it. And she ate, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. You know, the broad way wants company. The narrow way is prepared to walk it alone if necessary. And if you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, tonight, today, feels like night. I've been here since about 6 o'clock. Get that. The Broadway always wants to take people down with it. But the narrow way, the right way, is prepared to walk it alone if necessary. That'll give you some strength. Verse 7, And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Suddenly, we have this need to cover ourselves. Never had that need before, but when we're doing wrong, we have to start covering ourselves. The self-righteousness came in, and then the excuses began, as you can read. She said it was the serpent. Uh, the, the man said it was the woman. And the excuses began. Nobody wants to say, I chose this. I took it. Self-responsibility is, is a huge part of repentance. Here's what we've got to understand. From Genesis forward, there are only two sources of thought. Think about it. From Genesis forward, there are only two sources for any thought. You can trace every one of them back to one of these gods. God, big G, or God, little g. Cursed God, or blessed God. Every thought you have can be traced back to one or the other. And if we'll narrow our decisions down by that fact, we will not be deceived. Because I've, I've heard people say, well, it doesn't hurt if I... Trace that thought back. Just trace it back. And this is not a message of condemnation. Do you hear me, church? This is not a message of condemnation. This is a message of prevention. Every good speaker I know is on this subject right now. I mean, I, I opened up Rick Renner this morning. Guess what he's on? I pulled up Tim Brooks' website. Guess what he's on? God's getting the word out. Do not be deceived. He is for you. He is not against you. If you've messed up, then you just get right back on track and keep going. But let's do some preventative work. And this isn't just a younger message crowd uh, message here. 
I have to live this every day. Thoughts come to me just like they do to you. You don't outgrow that. Right? Outer edges. You're going to live this message the rest of your life, so we better get it down. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you. I have set before you, come on church, life and death, blessing and cursing. He gives you choices. you got choices. You're not trapped. Religion's not a trap. you got plenty of choices. Life or death, blessing or cursing. But then he gives this phenomenal statement. Therefore, choose life. Why? So that you and your descendants may live. Let's just put that in other words. If you choose death, you and your descendants may die. Oh, we won't die. No, serpent. That doesn't necessarily mean that we fall over dead when we make a wrong choice, although it might. Not by God, but by our choices. However, in dying, we die. Choices in your marriage, let's just put this where we live. If you make curse choices, death choices in your marriage, your marriage begins to die. If you make wrong choices in your parenting, you're headed, you're headed your kids down a wrong road. Your kids can overcome that with the help of God, but it's going to take divine intervention to, for them to go from what they've been trained to do. That's just a fact. I can't, I can't change that fact. In your finances, if you make wrong choices, you have a choice. Blessing or cursing. Life or death in your finances. It doesn't matter what subject you're talking about. This principle applies. We need to make good choices. When we make bad choices, he'll help us. He's a good, loving, merciful, gracious God. But preventative is way better. Jeremiah 21 8 and to this people you Jeremiah shall say thus says the Lord behold I set before you the way of life and the way of death you've got choices God's never taken away your choices he just wants to make sure that you understand the consequences of your choices isn't that what a good parent does Did your daddy ever tell you not to do something Did he ever tell you what was gonna happen if you did it oh, yeah. did you ever suffer those consequences oh, yeah. okay just thought I'd ask because he's over there. Yeah. Okay. Why do you think he told you not to do that? Because he, he loved you. Probably didn't feel like it necessarily at the time. Any don'ts that God gives us are to keep us alive. It's because he loves us. And we can look at our parenting father as putting his thumb on us and trying to control us. Or we can have mature thinking and think this thing through and see the end result. We can't, we can't think like a child. We're supposed to put away childish things, the scripture says. He makes the consequences clear. Life, death, blesses, cursing, life, destruction. God's way is not the only way. Absolutely not the only way. But he has ran his thoughts through the gamut of time. And every time you follow his thoughts, the end of that equation is life. Anytime you follow the enemy's thoughts, the end of that equation will be death. And there's a lot of space in between. And you can call that gray. You can call that walk in the middle of the road. You can call that what you want to. Whatever that space is, is still a path to somewhere. And we need to look at the end result. And we need to make our decisions accordingly. Let's go to Isaiah 55. It's not in your notes. Surprise. New Bible, new Bible. Where are you? You hear this scripture quite a bit around here. It was so important. I think it's imperative that we make this statement right here. In case you're new in the word. When you got saved, when you were born again, when you received Jesus as Lord, when you accepted him as your Savior, we'll say it enough ways you get it, your spirit, the real you, the inside of you, was born again. The scripture calls it 
a new creature, a new creation, born of the incorruptible seed of the Word of God that lives and abides forever. It's perfect. The real you is perfect. But when you accepted Jesus as Lord, your brain did not change. We call that the soul, your thoughts, your feelings, your natural um, tendencies weren't born again. I wish to God they were. It's not how he designed us. And so the rest of our Christian walk is spent what they call renewing the mind. The spirit was made new, but the mind must be renewed. You know what that means? When you renew something, when you renovate something, we have to get rid of the old and we have to put something new in. That's the process we are all in. And, and, and I almost, I wanted to teach on not staying on a plateau today because it is so important that we not get to a place where we think we've arrived or we're satisfied where we are in our think life, in our, in our thought life. And, and I know I was going to call Carl or Bob up here if I was teaching. I guess I kind of am teaching it anyway, aren't I? Um, you can hit a plateau working out, right? What do you do when you hit a plateau? You got, you got to change something. It may be the simplest thing. It may even take less effort than what you were doing before. But you've got to change something. And so we're constantly, every single one of us, renewing our minds. And this scripture talks a little bit about that. Verse 7 of Isaiah 55. Let the wicked forsake his way. Well, what's wicked? Well, according to scripture and everything I can find, anything that's evil or wicked is anything that doesn't line up with what God said. So you have to forsake what you naturally would do. You forsake it. You, there is a severance. You cut it off. You forsake your what? You don't flirt with it. You don't play with it. You don't keep one foot over here and one foot over there. You sever it. This is, this is for somebody today. And I didn't know who was going to be here. So if you guys on the front row are the ones, then it's for you. Just kidding. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Oh, thoughts. Thoughts. Forsake your thoughts. How do you do that? How do you cut off your thoughts? How do you leave your thoughts? You've got to put new ones in. You've got to put new ones in. If you had a scale up here and you have your old thoughts, you have to put so many more new thoughts in to overcome the old thoughts. And if you're not doing that, you will lose this battle. So what I'm letting in my gates, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, what I'm saying, has to be filled with the new thought. That's in the music, that's in what I'm watching, that's in what I'm saying, that's in what I'm reading. I can't afford to give my old way of thinking any more weight. It has had enough. It's had years and years, so it's going to take something to overcome that. So put the effort in, is what the Spirit's saying this morning. You can win this. You can get to a point where you don't think that anymore. That's hope. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But you can start today. And you can win this. Forsake your thoughts. Forsake your way. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy on him. He'll help you. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. It'll be as if it never happened. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. What would come to you naturally, the way you would by nature, under a curse God think? That's not the way God thinks. That's not the way God does things. So what he says next is important. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returns not thither, but waters the earth, and makes it bring forth and bud, 
that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, eater, so shall my word be. It's like the rain comes down and the snow comes down and it waters what it lands on. That's how his word works. And it will make it bring forth and bud. Go through the effort of listening to the word. It will bring forth fruit. It will not return into me void. It will accomplish that which I please. And it will prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you into singing. All the trees of the field will clap their hands instead of... Y'all know I love those, I love those words. Look, you've, you've sown a lot of bad seed. You've, you've got a lot of wrong thoughts. But when you begin to take God's thoughts and his ways and you begin to let those be the driving force in your life, then instead of what you deserve, instead of what you would naturally get, instead of the thorns, shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar, shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Instead of, that's what we're after. That's called the grace of God. That's called his mercy. Instead of what should naturally happen here. Because I take his thoughts and I take his ways that are higher than what I would naturally do. I get instead of. That's good. I realize that we're swimming upstream. I know that being narrow-minded on God's word gets you judged by people who call you judgmental. That always just amazed me how people say, you're so judgmental, but they're judging me as being judgmental. Just never quite made sense to me. I've come to understand that the word few in Matthew 7 means few and I have to be okay with that I have to get a place that me thinking differently is okay that means your choice on who you marry becomes narrow the choice of what you do with your finances becomes narrow the way you vote becomes narrow the school you send your children to becomes narrow who you allow your, your children to hang around with becomes narrow. Who you choose to hang around with becomes narrow. The words that you speak become narrow. Your financial choices become narrow. The thoughts that you allow yourself to keep and entertain becomes narrow. The word narrows it down. I can think this, I can't think that. And you can look at it as do's and don'ts and can'ts, or you can look at it as, I can have life. I can choose one way to live or many ways to die. I don't remember who I heard say that, but that will never leave me. Yeah, it's narrow. I can choose one way to live or many ways to die. How many choices do I really want? God's good. He's good. Everything in him is good. The words that you hear about him in the scripture are words like father, provider, shelter, refuge, the good shepherd. He's truth. He cannot lie to you. He will never deceive you you. There is only life in him. In fact, he is life. There is no life without him. There is no death in him. Then you have B. Choice B. The serpent. The old dragon. This is just what the scripture calls him. The, the, a liar. The father of lies. The tempter. The adversary. The accuser. The wicked one. The roaring, seeking, devouring lion. You know, when we make our choices real plain, there's not, there's a clear-cut choice here. But that deceit blurs the lines. And we've got to put it right down where it's really plain 
for us and our children to understand. There's two choices. One, the equation will end in death. The other, the equation will end in life. Please never feel like you don't have choices. You have two very plain choices. The lie is that there's a middle of the road and there's not. 1 Peter chapter 2. This is not a message of condemnation. I repeat, <laughs> this is not a message of condemnation. It is a message of life and this is the way to get it. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 9, if you think the Bible's not relevant, you haven't read it. Because, oh my goodness, you, you could have thought, other than the, the lingo, you could have thought that some of these letters written that we're going to read today were written this year. Because they so fit our society and the way it thinks. This isn't, this isn't God's first rodeo, folks. If you'll remember, when Noah was alive, he let it get down to where there was only one righteous family on the earth. And we think we feel alone in the way we think. One righteous family. He had to protect the seed that would bring Jesus into the earth. He had to build, have them build the ark. had to have them be saved. He had to protect that seed. But you're not alone. 1 Peter 2, 9. I'm reading out of God's word. It says, however, you are chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. People who belong to God. You're marked. <laughs> you were chosen to tell about the excellent qualities of God, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not God's people, but now you are. Once you were not shown mercy, but now you have been shown mercy. Dear friends, since you are a foreigner and temporary residents in this world, I'm encouraging you to keep away from the desires of your corrupt nature. These desires constantly attack you. Live decent lives among unbelievers. Then, although they ridicule you as if you were doing wrong while they are watching you do good things, they will praise God on the day he comes to help you. Did he, did he write that to me? Did he just write that to us now living in America who as Christians we never thought we'd see this day that good is called evil and evil is called good? I mean, when you go through and you read some of these letters, you just think, oh my goodness. They were going through the same thing. Any of that stand out to y'all? Out of the message it says this. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Ouch. Live an exemplary life among the natives so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they'll be won over to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. Church, don't fall for the lie that you need to look like the world to win the world. The whole reason they're doing all the things they're doing is because they're looking for what you've got. And they're trying to get it another way. And you joining them in what they're doing is not showing them a different way. As uncomfortable as it is to be light in darkness, to be that family, or to be that guy, or that girl, or that church, you being that is their only hope. That's it. It's their hope to see the truth. And right now, in our nation, across the churches, pastors are meeting at conventions to try to figure out how to make the world more comfortable in church. I submit to you that that is a lie from the pit of hell. 
that's, that's wrong thinking. We should be so full of life and health and good families and marriages and children that even when we have trouble, we don't panic and run. But we have something solid on which we stand even when we fall on our face in sin and mess up. We have such a relationship with God that they want in. We, we just can't fall for that. Go with me to Jude. One. Those of you who have read Jude know there's only one. This letter is from Jude. It's right before the book of Revelation, by the way. It's really small, one pager, hard to find. So, right before Revelation. they help you? This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. We could preach on that right there. I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father. That means he's writing to me. That means he's writing to you. Who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Here's the letter. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, which is a type of sin, by the way. But later he destroyed those he did, who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness. These are those that left with Lucifer, waiting for the great day of judgment. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns who were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, which simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was, urging with, was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. You can go back and study that. These people scoff at things that do not, they do not understand. Like unthinking animals... They do whatever their instincts tell them. And so they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them? Now, if that doesn't break your heart, what sorrow awaits them when they do what their instincts drive them to do? when they don't control themselves and bring themselves to submit to God, they, it says, destroy themselves. For they follow in the footsteps of Cain who killed his brother. Like Balaam, they deceive people for money, and like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs, that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in autumn that are doubtly dead, for they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. They are like wild waves of the sea churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They are like wandering stars doomed forever to blackest darkness. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people, and he said, Listen, 
The Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Please know if your sins have been forgiven, they're forgiven. Okay, those won't be brought up. You have been judged. If you're a Christian, you've been judged. You are now seen as Christ, okay? These people are grumblers and complainers, living only to satisfy their desires. They brag loudly about themselves, and they flatter others to get what they want. We talk about agendas a lot in politics. But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ said. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. That's what's causing division. The ones who are wanting to satisfy their ungodly desires. That's what's creating division. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. Until they see you, they don't even know they have a choice. But when they see you and the way you live and the way you hold your families and the way you raise your children and the way you put the word as final authority in your life, you make them make a choice. Now they know there's something different. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. It's a good key there. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering, rescuing others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. What? Your life could save people from hell? Amen. That's exactly right. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. This is the part of the gospel that today's church world wants to leave out of the scripture. And we cannot leave it out. If we leave it out, we're sending people into trouble. He said, do, please, show mercy. Show mercy to others, but do it carefully, church. You must hate sin. You have to hate sin because God hates sin. You can love the sinner and hate the sin. And that's what the church is either, the pendulum has swung either one way or the other. We've hated people because they were in sin. That was wrong. We've let people do whatever. That's not love. Jesus never condoned people's sin when he loved them. Most of the time you would hear things like this. Neither do I accuse you. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. But the, the, the society, this loose Christianity, has, has preached, don't throw stones, don't cast stones, don't cast stones. And they have totally left off the fact that love does not let someone go on killing themselves. Yep. We've got to get back to loving people, hating sin hating the sins that contaminate their lives because of love, not because of self-righteousness, not because you want to be right and you want to prove them wrong. One of the things that's said about Christianity today is that it's about what we're against instead of what we're for. Stay for love, but realize that love is way different than the world defines it. Even that this around the edges loose Christianity defines it. Love doesn't let people stay where they are. It takes them somewhere higher. 24, now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God. 
our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. Church, don't fall into the lie that you are judgmental because you choose life. Don't fall into the lie that you are intolerant because you choose to be light. Don't go gray to look good. That it just doesn't work. You are responsible to one being. We answer to one, and that is God. And I must do what is pleasing in his sight. And if the world doesn't like it, in fact, the scripture is very plain that the darkness will hate the light. Why? Because all things are exposed in light. Now, I don't go around looking for people to hate me. But if I'm the only one walking the road, I've got to be prepared to walk the road alone. We've got a lot of wimpy Christians who are social, crowd-pleasing Christians, and that's not going to hold in the end. If you want to get tough, you go back and you read the, the, about the lives of the disciples who walked the earth with Jesus and the apostles who came after them. And you'll realize real quick, we don't have it bad. All right, where did I get to? Oh, I wasn't through, was I? Did I mess up? We were in Jude? Oh, there we are, okay. Second Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to start reading in verse 11, and we'll read down through the ver first verse of chapter 7. I'm reading out of the NIV. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. You could put that in our society today. We're not withholding our affection from them. They are holding their affection from us. Keep loving. No matter what they say, keep loving. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does unrighteousness, I'm sorry, what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? I don't know. Let's just Let's just think about that. What does righteousness have in common with wickedness? We're finding way too much. There should be a distinct difference in righteousness and wickedness. Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they'll be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate. That pretty much sounds like a command to me. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves. Look, none of us are there yet. We're in this constant purifying. So if you're just starting this, this road of purifying yourself, don't panic. God will help you. We'll help you. There's help available. We're going to walk this road together because we're both headed to the same destination, and that's life. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. When he says come out from them and be separate, being separate has become a problem. 
We have this need to be connected. If you see anything in this new generation, it's this need to be socially connected. Coffee houses, internet, social media. We have this need to be connected. So separate has become scary to this generation. I mean, I'm kind of a loner, in case y'all don't know. I, I, I like to be alone. I got tickled because Terry Brooks the other day said she went and ate lunch by herself and like to have freaked her out. This is Tim Brooks' wife. She said, I will never, I will never get to an appointment early. I, I was like, gee, I actually kind of find some kind of pleasure in going into a restaurant and sitting by myself. I did it last week a couple of times. Went and ate by myself, you know, got to hear myself. And uh, we resolved some things while we were there visiting with each other. And, you know, but this society, it's like if we don't have some kind of noise going and we don't have some kind of connection going, how many times do we pick up our phone to see if somebody's tried to contact us? Houston, we might have a problem. We have a problem being separate. We have to get to a point where we're okay with that. This word separate, when I looked it up, it means to mark off by boundaries. Isn't that good? What separates us? Well, I, I have to set some boundaries. This is what I will intake, and this is what I won't. This is what I will think, this is what I won't. This is, and the Word of God sets those parameters for me. What boundaries, this is your question of the day, what boundaries that the Word of God has set has become blurred in you? I, I'm asking myself the same question. What boundaries have I kind of moved those lines back a little bit? The Word needs to set my parameters. My destination sets my path, and I want life. That is the end result I want. And I love you, but if your way is not the life way, I have to make a choice. I'd rather you come on this path with me, but if you're not, I have to, make, I have to choose life. I can't choose death. I can't, no matter how much I love you. I can't. No matter how much I enjoy our friendship, I can't. No matter how much I re enjoy our relationship, I can't. I can't. I have to set boundaries. I have to let the Word set those boundaries. And I love you, but I, I have to choose life. Not just for myself, but for everyone we have influence over. We're, our choices are not our own. They're not our own. Don't ever underestimate the influence that you have. There are boundaries I will not cross for you. And you should look at me and say the same thing. There are boundaries you will not cross for me. No matter how much you love me, there are boundaries you will not cross for me. Never think that you can cross boundaries and save someone. You're not God. You're not the Savior. Never think that you can cross God's word boundaries and save someone. You can't. You can't save them from where they are. You've got to be somewhere different. And that's what he's called us to. We were talking the other day about pastors who kick back and drink a few with their congregation. And um, I just can't do that. I just I can't have y'all over for the Super Bowl and kick back a few beers with y'all. I can't. Now y'all laugh. This, no, this is happening. This is happening in churches. This is happening because, you know, we want to make them comfortable. And I'm not saying you're going to go to hell if you drink a beer. I'm just saying that I know the end of that equation. I volunteered at centers where I've addiction centers where I've seen the end of that equation and I just don't want to be the one that's helping you walk that road. I don't care if it's overeating or, or using negative language. I don't care what it is. I've got to purify myself because I'm walking a road and I want you on the road of life with me. 
I thought I'd throw that in since it's Super Bowl Sunday. We are going over there to watch Super Bowl together tonight. We'll have a short service tonight. We'll go over there. I'm not going to kick back some cold ones with you. I'm not saying you're going to hell if you go home and you do. I'm just saying I've seen the end of that equation, and I just can't. I love you, and I want you to come to this church. But if you have to go to a church where you can kick a few back with your pastor, then you just do it. i got to stay right here. I, I'm just not going to cross that line to save you. Never underestimate your influence. God's banking on it. He's banking on it. To think your choices can snatch someone from hell, whether that's eternal hell or hell on earth, that's powerful thought. The God life is the good life, church. And it doesn't have to be boring. And it doesn't have to be don'ts. Life is do's. Do go have fun. Do fun that won't kill you. Do have a great relationship. Do it God's way and it'll stay a great relationship. Do have children. They're wonderful if you do it God's way. Otherwise, they will torment you for the rest of your life. I've watched people be tormented. I mean, they just like never get their children raised. Do it God's way. God's way is the good way. He is the way, the truth, the life. And today I want to encourage you to reel it back in. Reel those boundaries back in. Reset your parameters. Get narrow-minded, knowing full well what's at the end of the path. Don't be afraid of separation when what that takes you to is life. And in reality, it's your best chance of taking them to life. And that's just the truth. Amen? Y'all can stand. Not my usual subject, but boy, I couldn't get away from it. And so I started digging online, and I usually listen to several, several messages during the week along the lines that I'm thinking, and lo and behold, the Holy Spirit seems to be preaching the same thing all over the United States in churches that are not politically correct and not afraid to say, I am not going to kick back a few with you. I love y'all. What an amazing group of lights of people who are who, who not perfect, not far from perfect, all of us. I probably hadn't had a wrong thought since this morning. But you know, y'all need to know that. We need to know that about each other. You can come to us. You can talk to us. You can visit with this group of people in your imperfection because we're all working on purifying ourselves together. But as long as our destination is the same, we'll be on the same road. We might be in different places in life, but you'll never, you'll never be looked down on for making a mistake. Let's get back up. Let's reset our boundaries. And let's get on with life. Amen. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. If you would like more teaching, you can visit our website at www.rccenter.org or download our app to your device. The Russellville Christian Center is located at 305 Lakefront Drive. If you would like to purchase a copy of this program or if you would like more information, please call 479-968-7965.